I always loved Lassie, and I have very fond memories of watching her show week after week as she worked with courageous forest rangers with a penchant for falling into ditches or losing hikers down a ravine. But it was when she went on the road that I was deeply invested. She traded clumsy, danger-prone rangers for a small group of strays who followed her as she wandered about. One particular episode is still vivid in my mind, though I must have been six when it aired. In it, a scruffy-looking toy poodle gets its collar trapped between some train tracks as a train bears down. It's up to Lassie to get it free, and she does in the proverbial nick. Of course, there was no question she would to everyone else but me. I was bawling, so terrified that this poodle was done for. My mother attempted to reassure me while my father rolled his eyes in contempt, but both were ineffectual. All I cared about was the fate of that toy poodle and the heroism of the greatest dog I had ever known, Lassie. Getting a dog was a big commitment to me, so I wanted to make a careful choice based in facts. I did all sorts of research on dog breeds, trying to find one that would be smart enough to follow orders, but not so smart that it wanted to give them. One that would be good with people and other animals, but would be loyal only to me. I wanted a faithful companion, man's best friend. I worked on this for months, and then one day I was on the website for the Humane Society, and I saw Sophie. It really was love at first sight. That sweet face and those ears. I rushed over to the pound to make sure no one else got there before I did, and $60 later, she was mine. The folks at the pound assured me that she was good with people and animals, assured me she was housebroken, and assured me she had come from a loving home. Well, at least she was housebroken. She hates other dogs and goes crazy when they're around. And it's clear to me that she didn't come from a loving home due to the way she refuses to approach me if I'm holding anything that resembles a switch. But all these other things are even more true. She's adorable, she's sweet, she's fun, she's playful and very loving. For a while, Soph and I were living the life. We went for long walks, rides in the car. I threw her scraps of whatever I was eating. A retriever shepherd mix, she loves to play fetch and is played to the point where she seems to collapse mid-trot. Then after a beat or two, she's back up and wants to go again. We were living alone, so she had the run of the place. She slept all over the bed and the furniture, often resting her head on my leg while I read or watched TV. It was my house, but it was her den, and we were both perfectly happy. She was my constant companion. She was the first thing I saw most mornings since she got restless, at, got restless and would wake me up, pawing at me as if to say, come on already. We'd go for a walk, then have breakfast. I'd make toast and she'd get the crusts. Some days, she'd be the only other being I talked to. So, come here, I'd say at some point in the day. She'd walk over and sit in front of me. Why are you such a good dog? She never answered. <laughs> Seriously, why are you so good? Then she'd lick my, my face and we'd go play fetch. She was my bestest friend and still is. But she's also a monster. <laughs> About three years back, my mom came to live with us, bringing her beloved Tibby the Shih Tzu. Her faithful charge, who like most Shih Tzus, exists solely to occupy space on the couch and yap. Look, I, I like the thing well enough, and I guess she's cute in her way, but I'm not a fan of Shih Tzus, properly pronounced Shih Tzus. I like my dogs to look like the dogs I grew up watching on TV. Normal-sized legs and real schnauts. I want a dog that's ready for anything, whether it's jumping into the car for a ride or into bed for a nap. I don't like worthless dogs, the ones who are pointless beyond company and comfort. I prefer noble breeds who chase vermin out of tunnels or deliver rum to injured skiers. <laughs> or who fetch and herd. Useful dogs. Working dogs. Dogs who can feel good about themselves because they know they've made a difference. <laughs> like Lassie. 
Sophie and Tibby had met, even spent a week or two together here and there, but now they were permanent roommates. I can't begin to imagine how this seemed to Soph, a strange do-nothing dog invading her den, a dog that refused to bow to her as a leader of the pack, and a dog who was clearly my mother's favorite. Tibby sat on the couch, slept in my mother's bed, ate wet food instead of kibble. <laughs> Sophie had a look on her face that said, the fuck is this? <laughs> Which is exactly what I was thinking when I came home one night and found dark stains all over the living room rug. When I walked in the door, everything was fine. Soph and Tibby met me at the door, apparently happy to see me. Their tails were wagging as we walked up the stairs. The house was quiet, dark, calm. In the living room, I saw the stains, puddles of brown. I looked around for signs that something had been spilled for a knocked over glass. I checked the trash to see if Soph had gotten into it again. It was fine. The stains were on the couch, too. That's when I thought to look at the dogs. Soph was fine. Tibby had something on her face. It was her left eye dangling from its socket by a rope of muscle. <laughs> Believe it or not, I didn't throw up. I woke my mom and we went straight to the 24-hour emergency vet where an attendant sussed out the situation almost immediately. The dogs must have quarreled and Sophie, my sweet, loving, adorable Sophie, gouged Tibby's eye out with her teeth. It's common with Shih Tzus, the attendant explained. The way their eyes bug out, they're vulnerable. You say your other dog's a shepherd? must have been trying to hurt her or control her, and the attendant shrugged and took the blood-soaked Tibby back for emergency surgery. <laughs> to her credit, my mom wasn't angry at Soph or at me. She was sad for her dog, but she understood that Sophie didn't act out of malice. I was racked with guilt and paid the $2,000 bill, <laughs> refusing any help from my mom. I didn't even look when they presented the bill. I just handed them my credit card. Back at home, I sat on my bed with Soph, staring at her, examining her face as she slept. <laughs> to look at her, nothing had happened. When I thought back on Tibby, she acted the same way, showing no signs of pain or disorientation, wagging her tail while her eyes swung from its socket. <laughs> if I hadn't spotted the blood stains, I doubt I would have even noticed. Gone straight to bed with Soph by my side. This all stuck with me as my mother tried to figure out why it happened. Why would Sophie do that, she asked. They're BFFs. <laughs> no, they aren't, Mom, I tried to explain. They're dogs, and they don't have the same feelings we do. I was telling this to myself as much as my mom. Of course I know that Sophie is a dog and not a person. I was reminded every time she went berserk when another dog walked by or a Jehovah's Witness came to the door. <laughs> She'd snarl and bark, baring her fangs, letting everyone know what she could and would do if she were allowed. But that was all show. This wasn't. I was more keenly aware that she was an animal. To her, I was not a friend or a loved one, but an alpha she needed to obey. She would fetch because her DNA told her to. And if the vet's assistant was right, this wasn't even an attack. Her giant fang simply raked Tibby's eye out because she was following her genetic imperative. The truth is, Sophie isn't my Lassie because Lassie isn't real. She's a story I told myself, a four-legged imaginary friend who would follow me everywhere, a faithful companion who would always be at my side no matter how my life went. Sophie's job was to be my best friend, to never judge me, to make sure I was never alone. Sophie is a lovely, wonderful dog, but she's a dog. If it had been up to her, she would have let that train crush that poodle without a second thought.